Try it again. Not sure if my microphone is working. We do. Let's give that to you now. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Chicago and the Power Experts 2014 event. For those of you who don't know me or I haven't had a chance to introduce myself to you this morning and you haven't read your agenda, I'm Todd Snitchler. I'm the former chairman of the Ohio Public Utilities Commission and I'm now back in the private sector working at the law firm of McDonald Hopkins in Columbus. And before we begin, I thought I would review just a couple of housekeeping items for you uh, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, we'll take regularly scheduled breaks during our day today together. But if you do need to leave and come back, we would ask that you do so at your convenience. If you do, please use the doors in the back or upstairs uh, as you go so as not to interrupt the presenters as they're giving their uh, presentations this morning. As well, restroom facilities are out the rear door and to the right. Uh, and in the event of an emergency, your emergency exits are at both the front and the back for that. So just so you have that in mind. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, and you'll find them in your program, of course. But Nalco is our platinum sponsor uh, for the event today and tomorrow. Great Lakes Solutions is our gold sponsor. And then we have a number of silver sponsors, which include Calgon Carbon, TRC, FuelTech, Novinda and Golden Specialty, and certainly they are uh, here and we're grateful for their support, uh, as well as the fact that we have a number of exhibitors, including these fine folks, uh, who are upstairs uh, in both rooms, and we would ask you to try and uh, see the exhibitors in both of the rooms that are upstairs. Uh, so with that, I think that closes our housekeeping items. I would like to thank Eloise, who reached out and asked me to be a part of this program a few months ago while I was still at the commission, and at one point I did have to confirm with her that I would be the former chairman uh, by the time this uh, meeting took place and make sure that she still wanted me to participate, and she assured me that that would be the case. So with any luck, I'll do well enough that this will not be my last engagement of this sort. So with that and the pressure firmly on me to do well, and for you, we uh, have a great program for you today. I had some comments, but we started a little late, so I'm going to hold those, and maybe we'll talk about those tomorrow. Uh, we have this morning as our first presenter, Susan Hedman, who is the uh, EPA Region 5 Administrator, uh, and she has very uh, graciously agreed to give some comments and take some questions this morning. She is on a fairly tight schedule, so we want to be respectful of her time. So with that, I will turn the floor over to her uh, for her presentation and questions. And so uh, we will have a roving mic that will uh, be around the room. Uh, so when she is taking Q&A, if you raise your hand, we'll try and get the mic to you as quick as we can. So with that, I'll turn it over to Susan. Thanks very much, and, and uh, good morning. I'm very pleased to be here today um, to help kick off your conference with an update on U.S. EPA clean air standards for the electric power sector. I'll spend most of my time this morning discussing carbon standards, um, the standards that EPA recently proposed for new and existing power plants. But I'd first like to take a few minutes to provide a quick update on two actions that EPA initiated during President Obama's first term, starting with the cross-state air pollution rule, which EPA proposed in 2010 to address widespread violations of air quality standards in counties throughout the eastern United States. Violations that are occurring despite these counties' best efforts to comply because sources of air pollution in neighboring states impact their air quality. The cross-state air pollution rule, or CASPER, is designed to make it possible for almost 200 of these counties to meet EPA's current ozone and fine particulate standards, which would result in significant health benefits. Unfortunately, the millions of people who reside in those counties have been forced to wait for those health benefits. The cross-state air pollution rule was to take effect at the beginning of 2012, but the D.C. Circuit stayed the rule in response to legal challenges filed by several states and electric generating companies. However, in late April, there was some good news for the people living in these non-attainment areas. At the end of April, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals 
holding that the approach that EPA used to develop the cross state air pollution rule is permissible, is permissible, workable, and equitable. So we are currently on remand back in the Court of Appeals with briefs due in early July. During President Obama's first term, EPA also promulgated another Clean Air Act standard that impacts the power sector, the mercury in air toxic standard, which will reduce mercury emissions from power plants that contribute to high mercury levels in our nation's waterways and in fish and in our bodies. A number of states already have mercury limits in place. But that has not been enough to address this widespread problem. Hence, the need for a uniform federal mercury standard that applies to power plants in every state. The mercury and air toxic standards will also reduce power plant emissions of acid gases that cause lung damage and contribute to asthma, bronchitis, and chronic respiratory diseases, especially in children and the elderly. I'm pleased to re report that in mid-April, the DC Circuit rejected a legal challenge to the mercury and air toxic standard by several states and electric generating companies. So starting in 2015, the deadline for most power plants to install controls to comply with the mercury and air toxic standard will be seeing immediate reductions in mercury emissions and acid gases and immediate public health benefits. Now let's turn our attention to greenhouse gases and to climate change. If you're interested in an up-to-date overview of the impacts of climate change in the United States, I'd encourage you to take a look at the recent National Climate Assessment, which was released by the federal government last month. It can be accessed online at globalchange.gov. The new National Climate Assessment includes data collected from 1900 to the present that tracks a number of indicators relating to climate change, including temperature, precipitation, and the increasing frequency of extreme precipitation events that overwhelm water infrastructure, causing floods, and sewer overflows that contaminate our waterways. This photo shows Chicago's lakefront after one of the combined sewer overflows that occurred last year. To address these problems, last June, the White House issued the President's Climate Action Plan, which calls on EPA and other federal agencies to work with states to reduce carbon emissions. The Climate Action Plan also directs EPA and other federal agencies to work with states, tribes, and municipalities to protect our country from the impacts of climate change and to lead international efforts to address climate change. Carbon emissions are the biggest driver of climate change. Roughly a third of U.S. carbon emissions come from fossil fuel-fired electric generating facilities. And a slightly smaller portion comes from the transportation sector. EPA's work to improve fuel economy standards starting during President Obama's first term and continuing today is already beginning to reduce carbon emissions from cars and trucks and it's saving money for consumers. Now EPA is shifting focus to carbon emissions from the electric power sector. 
As the President's Climate Action Plan points out, at present, there are no federal standards in place to limit carbon pollution from power plants. But that is about to change. Last June, on the day that the Climate Action Plan was released, President Obama gave a speech at Georgetown University laying out his commitment to take action on this issue and directing EPA to, quote, put an end to the limitless dumping of carbon pollution from our power plants and to complete new pollution standards for both new and existing power plants. The President's Climate Action Plan directs EPA to work expeditiously to develop these standards. So less than three months after the Climate Action Plan came out, EPA issued a revised proposal to set carbon emission standards for new power plants. The proposed standards, which were issued pursuant to Section 111B, as in boy, of the Clean Air Act, are practical, flexible, and achievable, and ensure that all future fossil fuel-fired power plants will use modern technologies that limit carbon emissions, such as carbon capture and storage. EPA's proposed rule requires new coal-fired units to meet a limit of 1,100 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour and provides an option to give plants additional operational flexibility to average emissions over multiple years in exchange for meeting a somewhat stricter standard. The President's Climate Action Plan also directs EPA to take action to reduce carbon emissions from existing power plants, which, as I noted earlier, produce almost one-third of U.S. industrial greenhouse gases. When the President issued his Climate Action Plan, he also issued a presidential memorandum that lays out some very specific directions to EPA to follow to reduce electric sector carbon emissions. The presidential memorandum directs EPA to use authority granted to the agency under Section 111D of the Clean Air Act to reduce carbon emissions from existing power plants, 111D as in Delta. Section 111D is a Clean Air Act provision that has a lot of built-in flexibility. Section 111D allows EPA to identify the best system for reducing emissions, taking into account the availability of technology, cost, feasibility, and the size of emission reductions that are needed. Section 111D also allows for state-by-state -state information to be considered and does not require a one-size-fits-all approach. Section 111D also allows EPA to look at options that will produce health benefits associated with reducing carbon emissions and allows EPA to look at non-climate related environmental benefits as well. Previous EPA standards that relied on Section 111D of the Clean Air Act have focused on add-on control technologies, like scrubbers, that are technically feasible to deploy at virtually any facility. However, there are a wide variety of other ways to reduce carbon emissions from power plants that are commercially available, technically feasible, and cost-effective. Opportunities for reducing carbon emissions vary from state to state, depending upon a state's generation mix, the state's energy infrastructure, and other factors.
The President's Memorandum on Power Sector Carbon Pollution Standards directed EPA to propose carbon pollution standards for existing power plants by June of this year, which gave the agency several months to solicit ideas about the best way to proceed. So EPA spent about nine months informally talking with states, representatives of the electric power sector, and their industrial and commercial customers, labor unions, and non-governmental organizations. consumer groups, and others, so that we could gather ideas. We heard and agree that a reliable, affordable energy supply is vital. We also heard that flexibility is key. We also heard and understand that power plants are part of a large and complex interstate system, and that we should allow for, or even encourage, regional solutions. We heard about the many things that states are already doing. In fact, we learned that states are leading the way to reduce carbon emissions, especially through programs that encourage energy efficiency. 29 states have energy efficiency standards or goals, and 47 states have utilities that run demand-side energy efficiency programs. 38 states have renewable portfolio standards or goals, and 10 states have market-based programs to reduce carbon emissions. State and local governments told us that the impetus for these initiatives included concern about climate change, a need to respond to changes in electricity markets, and recognition that innovation in the electric sector is just plain good for the economy. This information about state efforts to reduce carbon emissions and to modernize the electric sector informed EPA's proposal to reduce carbon emissions from existing power plants, which EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy announced on June 2nd. Oops. Here's the basic structure of EPA's proposal, which we call the Clean Power Plan. EPA has proposed a goal for each state to reduce carbon pollution. The goal is based on a Section 111D analysis to determine the best system of emission reduction. This analysis, in turn, looks at what states are already doing to improve energy efficiency, and to encourage reliance on low-carbon energy resources. States choose how they will meet the goal and develop a plan to do so by no later than 2030. So how did EPA establish the individual state goals in the Clean Power Plan? EPA analyze the practical and affordable strategies that states and utilities are already using to lower carbon pollution from the power sector. EPA also analyzed historical data about emissions and the power sector to create a consistent national formula. Here's the basic formula used to calculate each state's goal. The numerator in this formula is the sum of carbon dioxide emissions at covered fossil fuel-fired power plants in the state, pounds of carbon dioxide. The denominator is the sum of megawatt hours of electricity generated by all fossil fuel-fired power plants in a state, plus 
other types of power generation like renewables and some nuclear, as well as megawatt hour savings realized through energy efficiency programs. So the denominator is megawatt hours, which results in a rate of pounds per megawatt hour. States do have the option of converting that rate to a mass-based goal as well. EPA applied this formula to each state's specific data to calculate each state's goal for the carbon intensity of covered existing fossil fuel fired power plants in each state. If you want to take a closer look at the formula, and I encourage you to do that, and the individual calculations for the goals for each state, you can go to EPA's website where you'll find technical support documents and spreadsheets for each state. The proposed Clean Power Plan establishes interim goals to be met starting in 2020 and final goals to be met in 2030 and thereafter for each state. Interim goals apply for, during the years 2020 through 2029 as states ramp up programs to meet their final goals. The Clean Power Plan gives states significant flexibility with respect to the timing of their carbon pollution reductions. For instance, a state could choose to meet the 2030 goal by making steady incremental emission reductions each year, essentially following the path represented by the red line on this graph. Or as the S-curve on the graph illustrates, some states might choose to spend the early years ramping up their programs, getting fewer emissions reductions in the early years and more in later years. EPA expects the timing of carbon emission reductions in each state to vary depending on the state's situation. Some states have existing programs that are already achieving results, and those programs can be readily expanded to reduce carbon intensity. Some types of measures are more easily implemented and or may produce immediate emissions reductions. For instance, Early emphasis on effective implementation of energy efficiency programs could help to postpone or avoid more expensive measures. On the other hand, some types of measures may require longer to implement and or realize reductions in carbon emissions. For instance, new multi-state programs or additions to existing multi-state programs may need a longer period of time to set up and to achieve goals. EPA used four building blocks to establish state goals. The first building block is making fossil fuel fired power plants more efficient. The second building block is using lower emitted power, emitting power sources. For instance, increasing use of existing natural gas combined cycle facilities and dispatching coal-fired facilities less often. The third building block is using more low carbon and zero carbon emitting energy sources, such as wind and solar and other renewables, and keeping certain at-risk nuclear plants online. The fourth building block is using electricity more efficiently by implementing demand-side management programs, many of which, and as I've mentioned to you, many states already have these in place. States will have a lot of options to consider as they develop plans to meet their carbon reduction goals. 
States can choose to rely to varying degrees on measures that EPA used to calculate state goals, measures included in the four building blocks, which are highlighted on this slide with a red asterisk. Or states can consider other measures that were not part of the state goal setting analysis, some of which are listed on this slide. States can integrate their plans into existing power sector planning processes and can decide how to treat plants nearing the end of their useful life and how to help electric generators avoid stranded investments. States can choose to develop individual state plans or they can choose to collaborate with each other on a multi-state basis to create regional plans. The proposed Clean Power Plan provides a lot of flexibility to states with respect to timing of implementation. There's a 15-year window in which to plan for and to achieve the state goal for carbon pollution reductions. And states will have up to two to three years to submit final implementation plans. A two-year extension is available to states that choose to collaborate with other states to develop multi-state implementation plans. When fully implemented in 2030, EPA estimates that the proposed Clean Power Plan will reduce carbon emissions from power plants by 30 percent. These emission reductions will produce public health and environmental benefits worth up to $90 billion, benefits that far outweigh the estimated costs of meeting the proposed carbon reduction goals. In fact, states that rely heavily on energy efficiency to meet their carbon reduction goals will help families and businesses reduce their electric bills. EPA estimates that states that include a major energy efficiency component in their plans will be able to reduce customers' bills by roughly 8 percent by 2030 by using today's technologies to get more work out of every unit of electricity that is produced. Even with these significant investments in energy efficiency, and increased investments in low carbon resources to meet state goals under EPA's carbon or clean power plan. Coal and natural gas will remain the leading sources of electricity in the United States. And EPA's analysis shows that this diverse energy portfolio will ensure adequate capacity across the U.S. electricity system to meet anticipated demand. EPA's proposed Clean Power Plan gives states maximum flexibility to implement carbon reduction strategies that preserve reliable and affordable power for everyone. The proposed Clean Power Plan and supporting technical materials as well as information about how to submit comments on the proposal are available on EPA's website. There will be four public hearings starting next month in Denver, followed by hearings in Atlanta, Washington, D.C., and in Pittsburgh. At this point, this is very much a proposal. And we look forward to your comments on the proposed Clean Power Plan. We want to hear from you. So thank you for listening this morning, um, but we look forward to your comments. Thank you.
We'll uh, take questions now from the floor. So if you have a question, you want to raise your hand. We have a roving microphone out there, and we have time for a few questions. We're trying to be mindful of Susan's time, so don't wait. Now's your chance. Uh, Susan, thank you very much. It's a, a great presentation, and I appreciate the information. Um, I'm a scientist by training, a technologist by practice. I would ask you to relook and rethink uh, a couple of your slides. The last time I looked, carbon dioxide was a clear, colorless, odorless gas. And I guess as a technologist, I object to the visualization of carbon dioxide as smoke or vapor phase coming out of a stack. We're in a society right now that Obama has admitted is uh, scientifically poor in terms of their training. And this just propagates more of that lack of understanding of what science is about. So I'd ask that you think about that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that comment. I would agree that carbon dioxide is a clear uh, gas. Um, it is emitted from coal-fired power pl plants along with uh, other gases. And as I pointed out, uh, the, uh, the 111D allows us to look at co-benefits associated with the carbon reductions, which will include uh, uh, reductions in other emissions that are visible, um, some of which are very visible, um, that are emitted uh, from fossil fuel fire generating facilities. Uh, hi, John Lumkuller with uh, Great Lakes Solutions. How much work was done with working on this proposal with groups like MISO that deal with the day-to-day, -day, how they're putting power to the grid kind of thing and how they're keeping base load and things like that in, in balance? Um, dur during the, the, form, the informal uh, process, um, EPA met with MISO and PJM and uh, other ISOs uh, on many occasions. Um, I'm familiar with the meetings with MISO and PJM uh, because those affect uh, the region where uh, Region 5 is located. Um, there was a lot of discussion. Um, I think some of you may even be familiar with some of the proposals that were developed um, by the ISOs um, to uh, talk about uh, taking on processes of, of tracking uh, some of this. Um, reliability is uh, an issue that is very much, uh, was very much on EPA's mind as we uh, put together this proposal, and uh, we worked very closely um, with uh, the regional transmission organizations as we developed it. I, I personally sat through uh, several of those meetings. Next question. No other questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, I look, we we uh, look very much forward uh, to your comments on this proposal.